Okay. All right, we're uh, live here from O'Keefe, so we'll get the show started here. we got a crowd coming in, so uh, stay tuned, and we'll get underway here in a second. Okay. Okay. Karen, did you want to clang the bell this morning? You seemed anxious. Oh, you already did it. I'm late. I missed it. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Another... Uh, uh, Wednesday morning coffee hangout. We've got some um, um, not necessarily new faces. They're, well, actually, some of them are pretty old faces, but uh, we just haven't seen them in a while. So, uh, oh, I am. I'm going to be 81. Oh, you're going to be 81 next week. I, I thought I missed a decade or two there, but uh, all right. Well, good. Congratulations, Ron. What's that? Yeah, until. Oh, that could be. Well, Ollie's not sure. <laughs> Ollie's making no comment. Well, well, because then we might learn how old Vicky is, and that would be a bad thing. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. We've got some things to talk about today. Um, hopefully, everybody's got a cup of coffee here from O'Keefe's, and um, we'll go through a few things. So. I'm going to sit down, and we will get the show underway. For the folks at home, you can uh, hit the question bar, and we'll be uh, answering some questions and things soon. Uh, I need to share my screen. So we'll click there. Sure we will. Always the joy of live broadcast, I suppose. Well, maybe we won't share my screen. Yeah, there we go. Come on. We'll try this one more time. And then the folks at home will just have to follow along. Screen share. Now do it. And nothing. Okay. We will move along. So the folks at home, you can check out our calendar. And we're going to head right there now, our home page. We've got some things going on. And I'm going to keep this brief. Um, there are some cool events coming up people need to know about. We've, of course, got all of our assignments coming up. Um, this one is just ending week uh, 68. Uh, the assignment was motion. So you need to, to get signed up last Wednesday and get going. The HDR assignments underway. Uh, you can still get signed up for this if you're an HDR fan. Um, and the assignment this week, we gave a topic of landscape. Some pictures have been uploaded already, um, so there's still time to get in. That'll switch on Friday. And the daily assignment, day 36, um, today's assignment started at midnight, so uh, the assignment is step into the light. Figure out what that means and uh, participate. We've got our uh, twice monthly documentary street photography showcase going on. So get yourself signed up for some of these things and get out there and start taking pictures. Um, flipping over to the calendar, we're at uh, over 1,800 members, but let's pull up the calendar. There's some cool things going on here. Um, Plenty of webinars going on, so if you're looking, uh, you know, the weather, the sea fog, the rain, and other things, we've got lots of webinars going on. Um, tonight we'll be over at the University of Tampa to do the evening shoot there. Tomorrow night we'll be at Safety Harbor to do the flight shots. Um, hopefully we'll have a nice sunset. Um, one of the cool webinars that's going on is uh, every Friday, Topaz Labs is doing a free lunchtime webinar. It's noon to one, and it's all question and answers. Um, so you can just tune in. If you want your question possibly featured, you need to email them. There's directions on the site. Um, email them. But So you may not make it for this Friday's. There is still time, but send it in. It may be featured the next Friday, something like that. But they do have an open Q&A period, too, and you can ask any, any questions about Topaz software or any of the Adobe products because they integrate, so they're helping you with Adobe products as well. Um, there's a do-it-yourself photo walk this weekend. It's the uh, Southern Classic Car Show in Gulfport. Uh, instructions and directions and things are on the site. Uh, Sunday, we are going to the Florida State Fair. And um, that's a, I've got a, a, an early morning start, but you can come late, come anytime. But one of the highlights, one of the features of it is nighttime photography on the Midway. So bring a tripod. And uh, you can get some cool shots at night, some of the different rides, 
things like that. But there's all kinds of events going on. I listed uh, many of the events, what's going on. You know, there's an Eagles tribute band at 11 and 2 and 5. And you guys are the right age. You'll remember the Eagles. It's not the birds. It's, uh, you know, the, it's a band. Okay. Teresa, you had a question? No, I think uh, you can get discounted tickets at Walmart. Yes, you still can. Yeah, that was uh, today. Today's last day. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, it's a couple bucks or something. So, uh, you know, you can see the racing pigs. That's one of the main attractions. Uh, there's an alligator show, sea lion splash, all kinds of cool events. But um, you can tell here one of the things that I most like is the nighttime. So bring a tripod. If you can't, you know, just come out in the evenings and uh, hang out and we'll get some cool things. So you get a little bit of an example of what's going on, and I uh, put up a little brief history of the Florida State Fair as well. So that's this Sunday. Hope you can join us for that. And, uh, of course, all the assignments, the Canon showcases, the Bird Journal. This coming Monday, we have our every other Monday night Lightroom study group. We meet at Tony's Pizza, uh, downtown Clearwater. Uh, it's limited to just 20 people because of his seating and things like that. It's absolutely free. Um, it's, it's more of, you know, um, don't expect uh, tutorials or this kind of stuff. Um, the idea of a study group is, you, you know, you've got some maybe some specific questions you need answered or some things that are tripping you up. Um, maybe you've got a file that's hard to work on. You can't figure out how to fix this picture or fix the sky or do this, do that. Or maybe you're having a hard time getting your pictures organized in the, uh, the Lightroom library and you want help on keywording. It's not just me. There's, uh, there's, there's plenty of other um, um, strong Lightroom users, experts, if you will, that'll, that are there to help as well. So it's not just all based on me, but um, you've got a pretty good brain trust there to draw from and get some help. So that's going on um, this coming Monday at 7. Get signed up. Um, coffee over at the Independent in Tampa on Tuesday mornings. Uh, next Wednesday we'll be here. Um, this photo walk's going to get switched up. We're going to start uh, the Wednesday evening ones. I've got a couple of new places to go. Uh, we'll be featuring those. Lots of webinars. There's a three-parter starting on Thursday the 13th. It is boudoir photography with Rachel Stevens. And these are the uh, three-day, seven-hour marathons. Um, they start at noon our time, end at 7, 45-minute break starting at 3. There's a couple of breaks in between as well, little 10-minute, 15-minute breaks. Um, but it's a, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday event, noon each day. Um, be some great learning going on there. So if you've got an interest in um, maybe not necessarily boudoir photography, you might. Um, but but it, just portraiture in general, there'll be some great tips and things. So if you don't catch it all, you'll learn a lot just from watching a few hours. Um, the Thursday, 3 p.m., this is the Quick Tip Thursday that Topaz is doing. And it's a 15-minute webinar. Starts at 3, ends at 3.15. Not really a question and answer thing. This week's, this upcoming week's topic, or actually it's next week's topic, is what order should I use my software in? You know, where, where, where do I start using Topaz plugins? Should they be the first thing, the last thing? Um, this week's topic, I skipped over that. This week's, there isn't one. Ah, so that's why there isn't one there. Um, uh, and then coming up, um, we've got a couple of uh, full moon uh, deals going on, and this is at uh, uh, 6 a.m. We've got a, uh, a full moon set, and this is, I should announce that. Let's send a little email out to 1,800 plus people. We'll see how many quit the group. You think I kid? Uh, that's the pier. Uh, shoot the full moon with Clear Beach, or Clearwater Beach, excuse me, and Pier 60 in the foreground. And um, it's a 6 a.m. It's pretty early. Uh, I'll double check the time. I think that's right. Um, there's free parking in the marina parking lot, uh, but at 6 a.m. you probably can park in the Pier 60 parking lot too. Um, so we got a couple people signed up. There's a moon set from a couple of years ago uh, from. Um, uh, Clearwater Beach. Um, the moon sets at 639, it says, and the sun sets at 709. 
So there's our, uh, so six o'clock does look to be the correct time. Um, a lot of people go, well, why can't I just get there at 639? Because, I mean, the moon's, it's all kind of over at that point, folks. You got to get there while the moon's still up in the sky. So that is the morning of the 14th, Valentine's Day, uh, and part two of the seven hour, uh, the three day, seven hour boudoir workshop. Um, and we've got a full moon rise that night we're going to do it from john's pass i've never shot it there but the photographer's ephemeris uh says this should be pretty cool and so i thought what better way to celebrate with your loved one valentine's day than taking her on a florida center for creative photography full moon rise and just to get everybody in the mood here you should go to the page i don't know if i, I should have brought the speakers today see if this will load Come on. Oh. Boy, I get it in my headphones. Let's see if I can get everybody else. Uh, uh, I can switch this over here real quick. Oh, Dino. Hold on. Sure, it's the essential Dean Martin. Oh, I don't know if I can. Come on. Everything runs slow today. I don't know what it is. Come on. Uh, no, can you? All right. No, I, I, I see. Okay, uh, let's see. Output. Speakers. Let's see if this works. Oh, I'm still coming through my headphones. I'm sorry. You'll just have to go to the website and uh, get uh, get uh, Dino uh, going there. But uh, all there for your enjoyment. Uh, the details, let me get Dino off in my ears here. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll get this hooked back up. Uh, headset. Input. All right. And I'm still talking, so that's a good thing. Okay, so um, here's the details. Oh, come on. All right. Uh, the full moon will rise at 6.20 p.m. The sun sets at 6.21, so it's about the same. And we're going to shoot it uh, by the bridge at John's Pass. The instructions uh, for meeting are up here. We're going to meet uh, at the entrance of the boardwalk uh, underneath the gazebo there. That's kind of the main central area of the boardwalk. And then we'll walk down to the beach. Uh, that will probably be the best site if you want to shoot both the moon uh, rise and the, um, the sunset. If you're more interested in the moon rise, the perspective from up on the boardwalk might be the better perspective. Um, but um, check it out. Um, starts at 545. Uh, we'll end about 745. Um, and gee, there's a pizza place. We could maybe go to a pizza place and uh, we can all sing uh, that Samore. Well, I could be, but I mean, that's part of the song, like a big pizza pie. Yeah, yeah that's in there, Karen. I wouldn't kid you. So um, um, come on out. We'll have a good time. Bring your uh, special someone, and that's the way to celebrate uh, Valentine's Day. Okay, I never should have put a quarter in Karen today. That'll teach me. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did. Okay, now then. Come on, calendar little cooperation here. So that is the 14th. That's a big event. Um, the, uh, if, uh, this is a do-it-yourselfer, the Clearwater Blues Walk at the Seafest Blues Festival. Information there, that's up there. There's stuff to do downtown, stuff to do at, um, uh, at downtown Clearwater. Uh, Saturday, the 15th, um, we've got a uh, coffee and photography um, uh, it was noted that I've also got this on. I've got to double check to make sure what's going on. I think that's just a misprint. At three o'clock on Saturday, at three o'clock on Saturday, we're going to visit the Florida Museum of Photographic Arts and see the current show, Gangsters, Pirates, and Cigars. Uh, there's a $10 suggested donation. Members, of course, are free. This is a lot about the history of Tampa uh, presented photographically. Um, the uh, Tampa Bay Times reviewed it quite favorably, so hopefully um, 
Uh, you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much more into here. We've got some big events. There's a Civil War reenactment on the 22nd. So if you miss, miss the Brooksville raid, this is at Fort DeSoto, much closer. Fort DeSoto, do you pay per car or per person? Per car. It's a, uh, what you're effect effectively purchasing is a parking permit. When you go into Honeymoon Island, it's a per person, but an $8 limit per car. So if you go in by yourself, it's four. Other than that, it's eight bucks for everybody in the car, up to eight people. Uh, we have a photo walk to Chestnut Park on the 23rd. Teresa and I were out there just a couple days ago checking it out. Uh, I've got some bird photographs I'll be showing today. Um, there's a lot of activity there. Um, uh, some great pileated woodpecker activity. Uh, there's a pair of great blue herons that are putting on quite a display at the nest they have. They're very accessible. I'll show some shots of that. Um, we've got our Monday night uh, hangouts that we're doing on the Google Plus. That's opposite the, um, uh, the workshops with Lightroom. On the 8th, still plenty of time to get signed up for this. This is March 8th. Some things going on here. Um, it's a $45 fee. We're going to the Avian Reconditioning Center uh, in Apopka. We're including a bird photography workshop and some other things to get people all trained up for this. Uh, these are all shots from our uh, recent visits we've done. It'll be a three-hour exclusive to us. No other groups are there. Um, they bring the birds out in small numbers, but we have multiple birds at a time to shoot. And so um, uh, we'll get there. We'll start at 8 a.m. when the best light is. We'll end about 11. Those that want, we can do an optional lunch on the way back. Um, there is a two-hour uh, workshop on how to photograph birds and birds in flight because they will be doing flight demonstrations again. Um, he will be flying his Harris Hawks, uh, probably a peregrine falcon, and one other bird. He's not sure. He's, he's been um, uh, occasionally flying an owl, so you may get a chance at one of the owls. Um, that uh, and uh, the indoor workshop is February 27th from 7 to 9 p.m. It's at the Education Building at Moccasin Lake Park in Clearwater. I'll cover metering, focusing, camera functions, how to set up your cameras. I'll show you plenty of examples. And then um, we also have on Thursday, March 6th, this is just a couple days before we go, from 5 p.m. to about 7 p.m. at Safety Harbor Marina. I'll be doing an exclusive practice session for those that sign up. So you'll actually get some experience in the field before you go, shooting birds in flight, things like that. We'll be talking about it and um, doing some of those things. After the Safety Harbor one, um, there'll be an optional uh, people that want to. We can go to Br Brady's Backyard or one of the other restaurants for some barbecue. Um, that's a shot of the, one, of the, one of his Harris Hawks. That's a little radio transmitter he's got on the back. That's a shot of the bald eagle. They'll set it up with an American flag, and they, they do some other stuff. So if you want some cool shots. So that's the deal. You get a two-hour indoor workshop, an hour-and-a-half flight lesson, and three hours at the Avian Reconditioning Center for just $45. Come on out. We'll have some fun. Um, we've got the railroad event on the calendar as well. Um, uh, that's going to be the visit to the uh, Florida Gulf Coast Railroad Museum. We start with a sunrise photo walk at their at the Ghost Town Willow, where they've got the locomotive. They'll, that'll be they'll be fueling it up, getting it ready to go. You can photograph some of the old cars, rolling stock that are there. Uh, they're in various stage, stages of deterioration, restoration. Um, they've got some old locomotives that they're parting out to keep the current ones running. They've got some they're trying to restore, so you can climb through these things and take pictures. We'll have about an hour and a half this time uh, before we get on the train. It'll be just our group. We'll ride the train from Willow to the museum in Parrish. It's a seven-mile trip. If we want, the train will stop along the way. You can get pictures alongside the tracks or other things. When we get to Parrish, you'll have about 45 minutes to photograph the museum, the train, and then all their regular guests will get on. We'll get on as well. We'll ride the seven miles back to Parrish with the guests. Um, no stops there. Our group will get off the train at that point when we arrive in Willow and we'll depart 
Um, there's a rib place nearby. There's some other restaurants. So they'll optionally, we can go to lunch, those that want to. And um, that'll be the day. That's coming up in April. We've got another uh, trip planned um, uh, with uh, uh, one of our members. He's the president of the Tampa Bay Watch. And you may be familiar with them. They have a large facility on the north side just as you head into Fort DeSoto. Um, they have a real nice pontoon boat. And uh, their president, Peter, is a member of the group, and he's invited us out um, to go to Shell Island, which is one of the islands in the Tampa Bay. Um, it'll be limited to about 25 people. There will be a nominal fee for this, but Tampa Bay Watch is going to give you an uh, honorary membership in one of their restoration projects and this and that. So there's a don there's a there is a fee, but it's a donation. It all goes to Tampa Bay Watch and that kind of thing. Um, I don't have that on the calendar yet. We're still waiting for confirmation, but that'll be late April, early May before it gets hot. And so those are some of the big events coming up. We've got some other ones, so that took way longer than I wanted. So sorry about that, folks. Any questions on the calendar or any of the other goodies like that? Jeff, yes. Can I talk about the Yes. Yeah, so that's a um, that's a uh, deal for uh, it's on a Thursday, isn't it? Starts at like nine o'clock. Right. Yeah, that's um, uh, it's open to anyone. It is a Thursday, so it's it's not a weekend event. Um, and it'll be helping to support the uh, Palm Harbor Historical Society. Um, so I hope you can join us. Uh, I will get the details on that. I just got those yesterday, and I will be posting them today. So I will send out an announcement about that. So um, stay tuned for that um, uh, coming up. All right. Any other questions, comments? Mary. Uh, tomorrow evening, uh, John and Ronnie Stewart. Uh-huh. Okay. And they're going to be talking about their Egyptian trip. Oh, cool. There is a fee, however. I think it's $25. Okay. Every fresh month. Is it the Sterling Society or something? Sterling. Yeah. Um, those of you that are familiar with the Dunedin Fine Arts Center or live up that way, um, two of our members, um, Virginia Stewart and her husband, John, or, yeah, well, she goes by Ronnie, but I think her name's Virginia. Um, I don't think they parents named her Ronnie. I could be wrong. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, they returned recently from Egypt. They're going to have a show. That's tomorrow night? Tomorrow yep, tomorrow evening at the Dunedin Fine Arts Center. 6.30. It's, it's part of the, their Sterling Society uh, events, and so there is a fee. It's a $25 fee, and um, you may be interested in seeing their photography. Um, Ronnie and John are very accomplished photographers. Somebody else will be speaking, too. Cool. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? No, oh, okay. Yeah, an announcement from Jack Frost. Photoshop Elements class, February 14th, St. Pete's College. Another event on, on Valentine's Day, February 14th. What a way to tell your loved one, I love you. Take her to a Photoshop Elements class with Jack Frost. <laughs> Sorry, Jack. Uh, what time is it? Nine o'clock in the morning. See, so you can have a whole day of activities. You can go shoot the uh, moon set, take her to a Photoshop Elements class where Jack will show you how to work on your moon set pictures. Then rest up a little bit because then you, you can come out to John's Pass and you can shoot the, uh, the moon rise and you guys will be all set and then we'll listen to some uh, uh, Dean Martin and go eat pizza. I mean, if that isn't romantic, what is? Doesn't get any better than that. See, right there. Yes, sir. Ron. Uh, I'll be picking up the coffee can, but I've not had another normal PSA. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the round of applause there was um, um, the uh, the annual uh, PSA update from Dr. Ron. And <laughs> every six months you buy coffee. So we just need to get this on the calendar. Free coffee every six months on Ron. We'll get some big turnouts then. But thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on that. I see, I see, yeah. Uh, I that that. Yeah. For all of you getting divorced because of your activities on the 14th, John Saggart has volunteered to pick up all of your divorce attorney fees. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Come on out, have a great time because John's picking up the tab on the back end. Okay. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Uh, um, let's see, uh, Nancy Steiner's written a few things. Any of them a question? Wish we could be in the house, hear the questions, comments. Yeah, me too. Only bad thing is we can't, yeah, yeah, that was earlier. We're working on it. Uh, where are they all select? Not sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you guys can't see everybody. Sorry about that. Um, you know, this, these hangouts are a little limited. Okay, um, this is the part of the show where we do the question and answer period. So um, if you've got a question for us uh, and you're out there, you can post it along there with Nancy's stuff. Anybody else have a uh, photography question? Yeah. Uh, last week, the food shoot. The food shoot, yep. You had a trigger that mounted in the hot shoe? Oh, yeah. I couldn't seem to find anything in that. Okay, okay. So, um... Uh, Terry Pallone is, was asking me l last week, for those of you that aren't aware, we did the food shoot here, and we set up some studio strobes, and um, what's, what Terry's asking about is uh, how we triggered those strobes, and I said there's a, there's a very generic product that you can use to do something like that, you know, if you need to trigger studio strobes, and I've got to, let's, let's see if I can share my screen yet. <laughs> There it is. All right. Start screen share. Start screen share. Oh, I have no idea. Probably a computer problem running a little slow. Yeah. It's just running slow for some reason today. Okay. So we are sharing this screen, it looks like. Boy, I don't know what I'm sharing anymore. Um, okay, let's stop that. All right, we're back live. We're going to try this. Uh, where is my... All right, now if I move that aside, bring this up, and try sharing my Safari screen. Let's share this. Come on, there we go. All these little modules got to initialize and stuff. Okay, so Terry is asking about these triggers. And where I uh, got them was Amazon. And that will bring me to another topic real quick here. I'll show you guys something we've been working on that might help some of you out with these kind of questions. This wasn't actually a plant. That's amazing. Okay, so um, um, uh, if I go to my account, uh, my yeah. Uh, view open orders. View your digital orders. Uh, your orders. All right. And oh, come on, log me in. So I've purchased these before. And this isn't going to get there. Yeah, well, you, you can be like Frank. Frank used to go, oh, you have the same password I, uh, that I do, dot, 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 <laughs> dot. I always knew Frank was uh, in my computer. Okay, so past orders, open orders, digital orders, order list by date. Past, uh, let's look at 2013. And, okay. 
So here's all the stuff I've bought from them recently, and here's my triggers. I had to buy a second set uh, a year a year ago or so, and this is what it is. It's a Cowboy Studio four-channel radio remote trigger with two receivers for studio strobes. Well, that's just the name of it. It's um, it could be also a aptly labeled um, cheap Chinese uh, triggers <laughs> or cheap Chinese studio. Okay, that's where all this stuff is coming from. Cowboy Studio is a, they have one retail location. It's in like Dallas, Fort Worth, and they sell just cheap strobe stuff. Mostly studio stuff, but they've got some other accessories and things. But it's backdrops and umbrellas and stands and this kind of stuff. And as you can see, um, I, I mean, if I were to buy Pocket Wizards, one of the name brands, um, I would be spending probably three or $400 for a trigger. Now, it would do some other cool things that this one doesn't, but for what you guys needed to shoot food, um, I really didn't need TTL. I didn't need anything. I just needed the flashes to go off when you push the button. And so if you remember what you were working with, it w this slid onto your camera, okay? And uh, this plugged into this, kind of plugged into the power pack. And that was it. This is a transmitter. This is a receiver, and when you press the button, there's an electrical contact on the top of your flash that tells this to fire. And it fires. This you know, sends a signal to here. It tells the strobes to go off, and that's how it works. There are four independent channels, so that's how using the same um, cheap Chinese studio stuff, we could have one set up there and one there because they were on different radio channels. It's like two different radio stations. So that's all we were doing. And that's all you need for just real simple flash stuff. Okay? The price? The price? $27.18. Free shipping on orders over 35 So you find another piece of junk. Uh, to, or I mean some, some other high quality Chinese studio equipment. And you got your free shipping. Terry. Yep, then what you got to do is we adapt this, this plugs into here, this plugs into here, and all you do is you get a, a hot shoe, a fake hot shoe, that your flash will s sit in, and actually that would be termed a cold shoe, and they may even have some down here, and that adapts to a light stand, let me see, are they going to show anything? Yeah, um... Yeah, here you go. A f here you go. So you get one of these. 688. Oh, we still don't have the free shipping. <laughs> Bear that in mind. I, I haven't bought enough Chinese crap yet. So I, I got a 688 item here, and, and your flash will attach to it, and this attaches to, I think, a light stand. I'd have to read. But a uh, swivel flash bracket, flash mount adapter, mounts, mounts on a standard light stand. So you get a little cheap light stand. This thing fits on top of it, tightens onto it. Your flash slides onto it, and there'll be a little adapter that the sink plugs into, and that tells the flash to go off. But I can put a package like that together for you. Um, Chuck? No. Uh, well, it it says these particular ones, but the only ones that won't fit are Sony Minolta's. So if you have a Nikon, a Pentax, a, uh, uh, a Canon, they all take a standard hot shoe or cold shoe in this case. And there's a hole cut in this that you put your umbrella through and the or softbox or whatever it is you're using and your flash goes into the softbox or the umbrella and that's your light and so it all kind of works together so you can real easily if you had a couple of flashes you could you know for probably not counting the flashes for under a hundred bucks you can probably get two umbrellas two stands one set of triggers two of these things and you're probably about a hundred bucks maybe a little over Okay, you won't pay shipping, and it's Amazon. Until they get their warehouse built in Lakeland, there's still no tax in Florida. They're building a distribution center outside of Lakeland. All right? So, 
Any other questions on that? Okay, let me show you something on Amazon that uh, Teresa has been helping me immensely on this. And so we need to go back to our website. And if we look at the front page, or any of the pages, you scroll down, there is a link that says Amazon.com. And I'm going to make this link a little different. But many of you never really knew that we did much with Amazon, and we are starting to uh, really ramp up this Amazon store. Okay, it's the Florida Center Creative Photography Gear Store and more. Over on the right here, and I, I, gotta, oh, they, I should still be sharing this, so the folks at home, hopefully you can see this too. Um, we've got some different things. I'm going to be working with my brother on this. Uh, I, I've got the Canon one almost done, or Teresa and I do. So let's say you wanted to buy a Canon camera. And so you'll be able to go here, Canon cameras. Um, it runs through it. I've got Canon cameras body only. I've got them with lenses. And you say, well, everything says too low to display. All right, so how do you figure out the price? Maybe you want to buy a, uh, let's see, uh, Ron, uh, to celebrate his 81st birthday, wants a, uh, another 7D. He needs three of them, just in case he falls on the first two. So you go, there's no price. How do I know what I'm paying? So you go add to shopping cart. And he can get a 7D 18 megapixel CMOS digital SLR camera with 3 inch LCD and an 18 to 135 F35 to 56 image stabilized uh, ultra low dispersion standard zoom lens for $1,799. And their prices are just as competitive as B&H and Adorama. You can still shop from those guys too. We got links. But um, people are constantly asking me via email or phone calls or in meetings, you know, about some of the gear and stuff. So we're starting to set up a gear store. A couple weeks ago, I was answering questions about tripods. I'm going to put tripod picks on there. You know, these are good tripods that you can purchase, and it'll be a way that you can have a one-stop shopping kind of thing. I've started some things with Canon brand flashes. Here's some of their flashes, but some of you have seen me use a better beamer or other photographers. Now you can find the better beamers for your flashes. Here's all Canon flash accessories, you know, and on the second page, there's a bunch of Stofen. You know, my brother Lou is a big fan of these guys as a, like a little portable, little soft box. Just real simple, efficient, portable light. Something that you might use when we do the Abilities Foundation event or things like that. They're great for, for people pictures. Um, and so I'm putting all this stuff together. It'll include, a, there'll be a Nikon section there'll be a small Pentax section small Sony se uh, section um, I've split it up into lenses and things as well so when you go to lenses here's some that are the most frequently purchased but you'll notice I've split it out so if you're looking for Canon brand wide-angle lenses you just kind of drill down into it and you go oh wow there's that 17 millimeter shift lens Jeff's talked about hmm, I wonder what that costs well, let's just put it in our shopping cart. It's only $2,499. Okay? Get a couple. Get a couple in case you break the first one. You just got to have a backup. So that's, that's, that's the FCCP gear and more store. Yes, Eileen. Uh, on, on some items. Some, some items are already priced, okay, and you'll see it. Some because um, when you see on B&H's or Adorama's or any of these guys' sites, um, there's what's called, camera stores use what are, what's called MAP. It's called a minimum advertised price. And you say, well, I thought, you know, price fixing wasn't legal. It's not, and it's not technically price fixing, but you might think of it in those terms. Um, Nikon, Canon, Sony, all these companies have what they call co-op dollars that they will pay back to the camera stores. And um, if you follow our procedures, and one of the procedures is that we have a minimum price. You can sell it at whatever you want, so it's not price fixing. But if you're going to advertise it and we're going to pay you co-op dollars, then you have to maintain this minimum pricing in your advertisements. So this is an item that's being, you know, those items that say price too low, they can't advertise that price. They can't put it up on the screen. Hi. 
And so that's the reason. It's this map advertising. Most of the camera companies do that still. John? In some cases, they're less. These items, the items that I've been picking, they are all being um, sold and um, um, delivered by Amazon, what they call fulfilled. So you are actually buying from Amazon.com. You can go to Amazon and you'll see you're actually buying it from like, you, you, you know, John's Dishonest Electronics, you know, and you go, gee, I wonder, they, they've got great ratings. They're, they're one out of five stars, you know. I wonder if I should buy my camera there. So all of these items that I'm putting up on there, uh, uh, the cameras, the lenses, the flashes are all uh, being sold to you and fulfilled, meaning shipped, etc., by Amazon. Some of the items like the Better Beamer, the stove and stuff, some of the small accessories, when I go to put in like triggers and stuff, so Terry and people can find, you know, some decent triggers that are cheap, some decent umbrellas, some decent light stands. Um, they will be, um, they'll be sold by another company, but probably fulfilled by Amazon. Uh, well, the camera warranties are from the manufacturer, but, you know, in my experience dealing with Amazon is they're just as good as B&H and Adorama. If you have an issue, they will take care of it. Most of it, when you saw me go to my account page so I could log in and do stuff, look at past orders, you know, there's buttons right there to start a return. And they will send you, or you can print out the return labels and everything. So Amazon is very, very efficient, very good company from my perspective on a customer service basis. Um, I think they're, they're right up there with B&H and Adorama. They have some other things. I mean, you may already be an Amazon customer. And, you know, if you've got Amazon Prime, there's, a, there's an annual fee for that. But that gets you free shipping on everything and all kinds of stuff. So if you're a frequent Amazon buyer, you know, they you'll still be able to participate in all their other programs because when you get to the, the checkout here, you know, it's the Amazon checkout. So how about sales now? Uh, until there is, uh, they're currently building a distribution center in Polk County outside of Lakeland. When that becomes operational, Amazon for everybody will be charging sales tax. Okay, even if it doesn't come from there, it may come from a warehouse in California, but because they have a physical presence in the state of Florida, they will be obligated to collect sales tax. So that'll change probably within the next six, eight months. Diane? I got a lens from a local person. Yep. I'd like information on it. Sure. It doesn't fit, but I'm wondering if I could get by an adapter. It was not expensive, so I don't know why. Ah, you bought an Ozek. <laughs> it says so right there. It's an Ozek. You know, that's one of the top 3,000 independently manufactured lenses. Um, this is, this is, a, not yet. Yeah, it, or, 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 or less. Yes. Um, this is a lens to fit an old manual focus Canon camera. Can I get an no, put it on my not not economically or anything else. Um, their Canon made when they made the switch over from the FD mounts to the, the their electronic mount, the EOS, the EFS mount. Um, for a short time, they did make adapters, and they had an optical element in them because it actually had to change how the lens focused. And those were quite expensive. They occasionally come up on eBay. There are some other ones out of Germany, but the adapters typically cost more than this lens did. You might spend $200 for the adapter. Um, who sold you this? I was at a local place, and it fit an old Canon, so I thought, well, all Canon No. Fit Lou can probably tell you a little more about it. Okay. But that's, yeah, that's for an old... <laughs> Eileen. Yep. Yep. So you want a recommendation on a lightweight tripod? Okay. All right. Um, I'll go to B and H's side. I, I don't want to. You know, doesn't doesn't matter. Let me uh, look around here. Tripods. 
And uh, B and H, they have one location in New York City. So unless things change, you won't be paying sales tax from these guys. So my general preference, I typically buy tripods and heads separately. Um, let's see what we can put together as a decent package for about four hundred bucks. Um, oh, they've got some Faisals in here. These are pretty nice tripods if we can find one in the two, three hundred dollar range. Uh, best sellers. Come on. Yeah, these are going to be too much money. Well, you're going to pay a premium for the Manfrotto's. Right. Right. Let me see how tall this sets up. How tall are you, Eileen? Five foot two and a half. All right. So maximum heights. Oh, that must be four feet. Forty-eight. Nah, that's not quite. See, the big thing about tripods, while, while I look through some of these quickly, um, is getting one that'll set up uh, tall enough so you don't have to be stooped over all day long. So it's, it's not hard to find a cheap tripod, but the problem is, is will it last? And will you get something that's too short that you're ultimately not very happy with? Right. 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 Okay, so here's one that might fit, we might be able to make fit. Enduro's a, a good uh, brand. Uh, they're doing it for 30 bucks. Um, it sets up to 61 inches, so that's five feet right there. We haven't even put a head on it yet. Uh, maximum capacity is 26 pounds, but that's all direct pounds. It is a carbon fiber tripod, so we're talking lightweight. Um, this is their, the Enduro CT214. And now what we want to do is pair it up with a good old cheap South Korean or Chinese ball head. Yeah. Well, there won't be tiny pieces per se. Let me see where we can go here. Um, so, if is it easier for you to grip something like this, or between like index and and your fingers? Okay. So a ball head's going to be ideal here. Because uh, like a three-way pan head, you pretty much need to grip it and twist stuff with your uh, whole hand. And so let's... Uh, these guys might have... Yeah, I'm looking at just a couple here real quick. Um, yeah, these things have been really highly rated. Uh, the K10X ball head's 113 so you'd be $414. And you'd have, this is rated to 24 pounds. It uses a, um, uh, the Arca Swiss uh, quick style releases, which are the industry standard. So, you know, a lot of times people, you know, the, the downside of the Manfrotto system is they have proprietary quick release plates. And once you get tied into that, you're, you're stuck with their ball heads, everything else. The, the rest of the kind of more advanced amateur professional world uses, you know, most of them use what's called Arca Swiss style plates. And they're a dovetail system. They're easier to use. You know, I've got them on my lenses. John, I know you use Arca Swiss stuff. Um, 
it's a it's a pretty neat system maria that's what you've got on that aquatech head so you got to buy the plate too you'll need to buy a few plates so those are some accessories um but that's really the way to go and then it's real easy you know if 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 you need to borrow a lens or this or that i mean all of my stuff is set up on arca swiss stuff and so arcus. yep a-r-c-a all right, so there's a, a real affordable $400, a little over $400 package. Okay. So yes, another question. All right, so we're going to get into backing up um, hard drives. Um, yeah, let's talk about that for a, for a, for a little bit, um, see where we can go. Um, and uh, Doug's got a question. Doug's asking about um, 41 megapixel phone cameras. Has anybody tried the one of the newer um, uh, Nokia phone cameras? I know they've gotten pretty decent reviews online, but uh, I don't think uh, I, I haven't used one. I'm a pretty confirmed iPhone um, user. I need to switch some things off here. Let's take a second. Folks at home, you should be getting the picture here in a second, sort of, maybe, kind of, I don't know what that was, all right, there we go, and why isn't that working right, capture, let's get rid of that lower third, there we go, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, turn this around, people can see me up there, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about backing stuff up. And this becomes a topic that we um, deal with quite frequently from time to time, dealing with hard drives and a number of things. Um, so um, there's, a, there's a couple of guidelines on backing up anything that's important. It could be your photos. It could be tax documents, you know, things that you have electronically that you just can't lose today, okay? And so um, uh, the current kind of thought is, is you need to have these things stored in sort of three kind of separate places, okay? So one, your stuff lives on a computer. That's fine. What happens if the hard drive on the computer dies? Be it solid state, whoops, did some weird colors there. Let's fix that. What is causing, there we go. Um, uh, could be solid state, could be a spinning hard drive, whatever, whatever it's all going to die eventually. So if you don't have it backed up to something else, you're just out of luck. You can pay for expensive data recovery, and I mean thousands of dollars in many cases, and there's still no guarantee that they'll recover much of anything. So the simplest form of backup is uh, you just buy an external drive, plug it in, and you know the simplest thing would be to just copy your hard drive and most of your important data would be there. If you had a hard drive crash, you still are going to have some pain over um, trying to do a restore. You just basically have a copy of your documents. But Jack, this question came up um, recently. Uh, doesn't Windows 7 and 8 have a built-in backup application? Yes. Yes. You don't sound like you're a big fan of it, but... Very nice, but they do have it. Yeah. It yeah. So even built into Windows, if you're a Mac user, it's called Time Machine. It's built into it. If you're a Windows user, there is an application built into the operating system that will, um, you know, you can usually set up a schedule and every night or something like that, it'll back up your work. If you don't like the Windows one, I'm sure Norton makes one and some of these other guys. There's free ones. You know, um, so, and they're the same way for the Mac. You know, there's one called Super Duper Cloner. You know, that's, a, that's an Apple Mac one. Uh, but Time Machine is actually pretty nice, what Apple gives you. And that will periodically back up your stuff. And so now you have an immediate copy. So if your hard drive goes down and you're doing your backups right, you can just put a new hard drive in or your technician can, and from the backup, they do a restore, and you would never even know that the hard drive died. It will put your whole operating system, everything else back on, and you're up and running, and you still have your backup, okay? So that's the simplest form, um, but what happens if lightning strikes your house and your computer 
gets fried and your external hard drive. Well, you're back to being out of data. So basically, you had things backed up only in one place. You had it backed up locally. You had that local hard drive. So the other thing that you do is you would buy a second external drive. And you can piggyback them or you can plug them into multiple USB ports. Hopefully, you're using USB 3. It's much quicker. You have a modern machine. Firewire works, too, if you're on the Mac or um, uh, eSATA and some of the other uh, data connection points. So um, uh, you would have a second hard drive. And when your machine does its automatic backup, it just sends the data to both hard drives. And, and you've got a second hard drive. And then every then once you've got that second copy, you take it to the neighbors, or you put it in the safety deposit box, or you take it to work with you. And every um, week or so, you rotate out your hard drives. And so you take the one that's got the current backup to work, and you take the one that was at work and plug it in, and it'll go, oh, all this data is not backed up. Well, we have to catch this drive up, and it'll make that drive current. And so under that plan, the most data you might be out is one week's worth of data, OK? Because let's say you, know, you, you got it swapped out, and one week to the day, lightning strikes, and you hadn't gotten your hard drive from work, you would have lost a week's worth of work. That would be what you'd be out, OK? Um, so that's the advantage of a remote one. The other one is, because it's pretty easily accessible, you can get back up and running fairly quickly. Um, so that protects against some things, but let's say, you know, there's tornadoes or hurricanes, these catastrophic events, so you want to have it backed up to the cloud. And so, um, but for many people, your, um, your data up, upload rates, unless you're running Fios, it would take you forever to back up. You know, one of our members did it. It was over 30 days, she said. She had Bright House. It was over 30 days to get her data, and it wasn't huge onto a cloud storage site. So for some people, the way to do it is um, just back up your maybe 1,000 best pictures or 2,000 best pictures, and your important financial documents and those kind of things live on the cloud. You can access them rather quickly and those kind of things so you can get back up and running. There are a couple companies. One of them is Crash Plan, and Crash Plan for a $100 fee, they will send you a hard drive. You put all your data onto that hard drive, and then you ship it off to Crash Plan, and they take your data off of the hard drive and put it onto the cloud, their servers. And then your machine just does periodic backups. Whatever comes new goes up on the cloud, and it can do that overnight or in less time. So, but there's a fee for that, and you know, Crash Plan is just one of the cloud brace. Many of you. Um, What's the other one that's popular? Carbonite is a popular service, things like that. Ron? I, I use Carbonite. You use Carbonite? I told you about Express, but with Carbonite, uh, you just sign up. I think it's $59. Yep. And you just, you know, you just start uploading. And I took mine for three or four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And I had 400 gigabytes. Yeah. And it's working perfectly. Yeah. I've only got over 10 times that. <laughs> in a year I'd be all backed up golly <laughs> yeah just the, the limit is how fast my data gets there I could be 81 years old by the time my hard drive gets all backed up <laughs> Nick it, they probably have different price plans yeah 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 Sure. Any place where you got sure. Sure. And there's 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 multiple services like that. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you just have to kind of check them out. Um, Amazon. They own the cloud anyway. Uh, Amazon has a data services. Um, Microsoft does. Apple does. They, Apple calls theirs iCloud. What's um what's what's Microsoft's Cloud Drive or something like that? Drive. What what is it? SkyDrive, SkyDrive, they've all got it. They'll give you so much free, most of them. Um, you know, Google has their stuff as well. If you're just worried about your photos, a basic Smug Mug plan can work for, for you as well. They'll give you a photographer's website for free, 
and um, they have unlimited storage of photos and um, videos. Um, the, the limit is it's uh, a 50 megabyte file size, and they don't back up raw files. So it's got to be JPEGs and TIFFs, I believe. But, you know, on that side of it, you get your photographer's website and everything, and you should be good to go. So that's a possibility if you're worried mostly about your photography. Um, there's competitors to Smug Mug as well as Folio. There's one called Photo Shelter. Those are all popular, um, you know, backing up kind of solutions there. Um, even uh, Flickr has a, uh, they have unlimited storage, but they've got some, you know, as far as total amounts of data, but they have limitation on file formats and things like that as well. So you got some various options there. Does that help? No, you try to set up one of these software solutions is better. If you just copy you and your, your, your hard drive dies, they won't be able to do a simple restore. You'll need... Just the photos. I just want to copy the photos. Yeah, if you just want to copy photos, you can just click and drag them. Okay. You know, it's that simple. Or you can set up a folder and do a copy or, you know, whatever you want to set up. But, you know... Um, yep, yep. Um... Any other questions, real quick? Yes. How many of your photos do you actually save? Like, I used to save all my photos, but now that I'm shooting in RAW, I delete about 95% of them because they take a lot. I have a huge computer, but still, I'm filling it up. It's, it's um, sure. And so, so the question is, um, what about photos? And that's a personal thing. Um, some people don't throw much out at all. And um, the concept there is, you know, if it's obviously blurry, out of focus, you know, whatever, delete it. If it's just, hey, it's okay shot, but nothing special, maybe you don't want to spend the time micromanaging those pictures. They just live on your computer, okay? And so what, you, what you're weighing out effectively is what my time is worth, okay? So if I have to go through hundreds, if not thousands of photos, to get just the the 10 best I'm going to keep, but I spend 10 hours doing it, what's my time worth for 10 hours? Maybe I should just spend $69, $79 and go buy another terabyte dive because my 10 hours of time, and that's just, that's just a few thousand photos. Multiply that times 500 gigs of photos, you know, a hard drive's cheaper. So I don't, I don't edit ruthlessly my pictures because my time is limited and so I go through the crap and the garbage and I delete that but most of them are like you know it's in focus you know and I could crop it and do this and that and make it a a, a, a decent picture am I gonna do it right now no but I'll save it on my computer my space is cheap you know hard drives are are historically cheap um, all right let me talk about something I talked about this on our Google Hangout because um, we've got some of the some of the wildlife photographers here, I need I need to pull up my. Uh, we're we're, we're going to try and do some photo sharing again. Yeah, mm, screen share. Wish me luck here. All right, that's up. Uh, which one looks like? Ugh, cancel. Where is my Safari screen? All right, bring that up. Now we'll try. Come on, because I got some pictures I want to show. And we'll click there, click here. Come on, you can do it. Okay, so now we're sharing my screen. And I'm going to go back to here. And I'm going to go up to Photos. And I'm going to show a couple photos here. Uh, this is from the Weekly Bird Journal. I posted these, I think, Monday night. And uh, I've, I've talked a couple of times about a new lens that's out, that's out and I uh, um, got a chance to take some pictures with it. These are, uh, I know Terry, Sandy, a couple people, Gail, um, went to the event at uh, Boyd Hill. But these were taken Monday morning. 
and uh, you guys are looking at it through a projector here. The folks at home will actually have a nicer view than you do. But I'll, I'll pull this one up just to start while I talk about things. Um, uh, black cap chickadee, but um, there's a new lens for nature photographers on the market. And this is the lens. It is the Tamron um, 150 to 600. I'll, I'll pass it around here in a little bit if those want, people want to look at it or what have you. It is a traditional two-touch zoom. It focuses, zooms from 150 to 600. Um, and I've never been a big fan of the Tamrons, the Sigmas. When I shot with Nikon, I bought Nikkor lenses. When I shot with Olympus, I bought Olympus lenses. When I, when I shoot with Canon, you know, I bought their lenses. But this has gotten a lot of buzz. And it is, um, what's intriguing about it is the zoom factor, having a zoom that will go to 600 millimeters. Because that's really, if you want to do, you know, these little, what we always call dicky birds or passerines, the perching birds, smaller birds, you really need to get into that 600 millimeter focal length. That's the length that you need to get to. And traditionally, it's a very, very expensive proposition. Um, a new Canon 600 millimeter um, is probably around $12,000. Okay, not, I mean, you know, it's kind of chump change. You know, save up your, your lunch money, coffee money for a week or two. You can have one. Um, but, uh, but for most of us, that wasn't affordable. So then we looked at, you know, getting a 300 millimeter lens and putting a 2x teleconverter on it to get to, you know, that 600 millimeter length. And we found out that teleconverters don't work real well and we lost image quality and we needed big expensive tripods and all this stuff and we still weren't there. We were frustrated. And so Sigma and Tamron, you know, there were, there's, there's several out there now. They're in the 200 to 500 millimeter range, which gets you very close. But the optical quality, when you looked at uh, Sigma makes a 50 to 500, it's about $1,700, $1,800. And when you looked at the quality of it compared to like the Canon 100 to 400 that many of you are using or the Nikkor 80 to 400 in that range, you see that it's um, uh, uh, the Sigmas and the Tamrons just aren't there. So last fall, Tamron announced this lens, and the, everybody was shocked by the price point. It's a little over $1,000. And so the initial response was, this thing can't be any good. That um, $1,000 zoom lens that goes to 600 millimeters, it's almost like the holy grail. And um, so they started shipping these lenses in the U.S., couple weeks ago, middle of January, and the first shipment has all pretty much gone pretty quick, but I've had a chance to shoot with one now since uh, Monday, and so Teresa and I, there was all this sea fog, we went over to Chestnut Park, and I wanted to put this lens through its paces to see what it was really capable of. And it is very sharp, let me go back to that picture. To get this kind of detail uh, is just amazing. Um, no, it's handheld. This has uh, the Tamron version of um, image stabilization or vibration reduction. They call it VC, vibration compensation. Um, their literature states it's about four stops. Um, I don't think it's that much. Uh, I'm a pretty steady guy. I shoot with the Canon 70 to 200. I've had that lens for um, three or four years. Uh, it's, it's Canon rates it at four stops, and I think it is four stops. This, I would say, is more two, maybe two and a half stops. Um, but, so what happens if you're shooting it lower than that? You just get a lower percentage of keepers. So um, we'll talk about how that will factor in on a few things in a little bit. But that's, that's a little uh, Carolina chickadee out at um, Chestnut Park on Monday. The backgrounds are going to all be white. These are less than ideal, whoops, less than ideal uh, shooting conditions because of the sea fog and everything that morning. Um, we, it is a F, uh, at 150 millimeters, it's F5. At 600, it's 6.3. And it's actually, a lot of these were shot at 6.3. Um, but it definitely does, if you can stop it down to F8, you can see an increase in sharpness. Um, 
So that is the, uh, and here I shot that at ISO 800. That was shot at F8 at a 250th of a second handheld. So that was the image stabilization that paid off there. Uh, let's see, where are some other ones? Here's another shot. A little chickadee again. That is uh, a 250th of a second at, at F8 again. Great detail. Little tufted titmouse. That is uh, a 250th at F8. And this is right on the boardwalk uh, by the volleyball court. If most of you know where that is, you know, the, the walkers that go through Chestnut Park, they leave seeds behind, so the birds come up very close. Uh, Northern Cardinal, and I'm not using flash with any of this. This is handheld at a 50th of a second at F8. And we can look at that full size. And it's, it's sharper on my screen than what you guys are seeing there. Um, Teresa said, she goes, is that you in the bird's eye? And I say, yeah, it is. That's my reflection in the bird's eye. Neat lens. Um, uh, where's the next one? I just got a few of these. Little black and white warbler. Uh, what was I, 250th at F8. Um, one of the wrens, Carolina. Carolina wren. Thank you. My mind went uh, blank there. A uh, hundredth of a second at F8. Another warbler. Uh, Five hundredth of a second at F7.1. All of these are ISO 800. Um, 500th at F7, little uh, downy woodpecker there. ISO 800? ISO 800 I'm shooting at. Because of the fog? Yeah, oh, and to keep the shutter speed up, you know. Um, I mean, if I shot all of these at, you know, a 50th of a second, you know, only one out of 10 or two out of 10 might be sharp, okay? So the higher I can get the shutter speed up, the more keepers I'm going to get. This is a thousandth of a second at f7.1. And th as some of the fog started to burn off a little bit, you know, I did get some higher shutter speeds, which I prefer. Pileated woodpecker. That is uh, 3 20th of a second at 7.1. The big challenge with these guys is... They're always pecking. So you'd be surprised how fast that head moves. And so, you know, on this, if you can't get your shutter speed up, fortunately this was even a little later in the morning. This was probably closer to 10 o'clock. You know, I was able to get my shutter speed up a little more. And there's uh, the pair of blue herons. Now we'll be headed there in another uh, week from Sunday, I think it is. That's the female with the stick, and the male was getting ready to copulate. Another pileated, same one. Um, oh, I don't have the uh, the specs on that one. Is this autofocus pretty good? It's, um, <laughs> so Terry Pallone's question is, does it autofocus good? And I'm noticing a couple of things. One is, um, uh, there's sometimes kind of a, a hesitation. And, but in most of these cases, I was on the bird within a second. But it does seem to, it just can't, like most of my Canon lenses, they'll go, oh, and they're right there with very little. This thing seems to, it wants to back up, and then it says, whoops, wrong way, and then goes into focus so it takes you know but this was less than ideal conditions because of the sea fog um, and I was getting focus within about a second to maybe a second and a half at the most okay 
Um, so I would say the focus is similar to the Canon, except this little little hunting thing it does. And that's been noted on the web. I, I've looked at um, photography on the net, DP Review, Fred Miranda, a lot of the big forums. Um, people that own this lens and are you know just starting to shoot it, they're noticing some of these same things as well. The kind of rumor is, well, maybe they'll re release a firmware fix for it. Who knows? So far, it's not available. The Nikon mounts won't be available until about mid mid March to the beginning of April. Sony mounts will be available probably late May, early June. Okay, so they just, you know, because of limited capacity and things, they're not as big a company as Nikon or Canon. They have to roll these products out, you know, in a sequence. Um, rather than having too few of all the mounts and everything sells out, they're trying to get the Canon production up and those users satisfied. So the Canon people are kind of the guinea pigs this time. Uh, um, and so, but the, the hope is that there'll be a firmware release fix and, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get to, uh, fix it. Um, weighs four pounds. So um, Teresa has the 100 to 400, and it weighs one pound more. That that lens weighs a little over three pounds. This weighs a little over four pounds. So it's it's a four pound lens. Can you say how much it is? It is um, a thousand sixty nine dollars. Takes ninety five millimeter filters. Lou, you have a comment. Yes, it does. So that it does not try and rack all the way back to close focus and then back out to infinity. You can set it that it will only focus within the certain zones that you're trying to shoot. Yeah. So, yeah, for bird and flight stuff and some of this now, because I was so close to these birds, um, the ones on the boardwalk, I was probably at times within 10 feet of them. Anybody that's walked the boardwalk knows what I'm talking about there. Um, but probably most of them were between 15 and 20 feet. And so, um, you know, there's really not much, much application for the focus limiter there. When you activate the, you know, flip the switch on the focus limiter, it's more for bird and flight stuff because it's leaving out those near distances. It's assuming you're not taking a picture of a bird in flight, arm's length. And so, uh, and unfortunately, I haven't had you know, the time or um, been able to go out and shoot when we've got a sunny day. So I really don't have an opinion on it yet as to how it's going to be for flight shots. I'll tell you in a second. I know the reproduction ratio is one to five focuses down to um, about eight and a half feet. And so it's, um, when I say one to five, it's one fifth life size. So when you're at minimum focus distance at 600 millimeters, you're capturing things. So that will be adequate for um, uh, butterflies and things like that, you know. Um, gives you a, a big working distance though. Eight, eight feet's pretty far to be away from a flower at times. So you just got to, but if it's a stinging insect or a snake, maybe that's a good um, thing. So it plays out both ways. So I don't have any flight shots to show you. I think I have one more still from this or not. Nope, nope, we go on to Greg's. So um, those are the ones I've had time to uh, um, go through. Uh, they have some sharpening applied in Lightroom, but I didn't do a lot of stuff. Um, if you want, if anybody wants to see or get my raw files on some of these shots, let me know. I'll stick them in my Dropbox, and you can download some of my raws and play for, play, blah, 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 play with them yourself. If you want a JPEG, you can get large JPEGs right on the Meetup site. Go to um, go to all sizes and click on original. What you'll need to do is, is, is like copy and paste this into your browser probably and then you can download it, okay? Uh, what does right click do? Right click doesn't do anything, okay. Probably messed up my, uh, my, my event. So, okay, so any other questions on that lens? What's that lens for? It's the Tamron 150 to 600. Uh, so the question is, having shot with the Canon 100 to 400, would I stop shooting with it and switch over to this? And I would say the answer is yes. 
Um, it is, I think, um, you know, that's a tough thing to compare. So I have shot. Right. I have, well, here's the real advantage here. The real advantage is that this thing goes to 600 millimeters. So from 401 millimeters to 600, this kicks the Canon lens's butt. Okay. So you've got that going for it. Um, at when you put both of them at 400 millimeters, they, um, uh, uh, I think they're, they're very comparable. The Canon might have a very slight sharpness edge wide open. Okay. But if you can stop this down to F8, um, I think they're, you're splitting hairs on sharpness. Um, the, uh, um, the other advantage is, though, when you take the 100 to 400, I mean, put the Canon 1.4X teleconverter on it. Now, on your camera, it won't autofocus. On mine, it will, because I can autofocus to f/8. Um, you will, you will be frustrated. And my, or not my lens, but the Tamron lens at 600 is sharper than the Canon lens with a teleconverter. There's no doubt about that. The autofocus is faster than the 100 to 400 with a teleconverter. So from that point, based on you know my skill set, I would buy the Tamron lens. Well, the, the guys that I hang out with now that used to all use the 100 to 400 now go on to 600 to 800 millimeters with a teleconverter. Yeah. Uh, they're 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 it's not a cheap hobby. So I um I'll I'll tell you what I would match I I, I would match this lens at 600 millimeters with many of those because one of the big advantages will be you can handhold it. Every single shot you saw there was handheld. I I purposely didn't shoot it on a tripod for a reason. Even though I have a tripod, you know, my Arca Swiss plate on it, I have not shot that lens on a tripod yet. And when I do flight shots, typically you can't run them off of a tripod. You can try and do certain things. So again, when they go to do flight shots, I know a few people in the in the world. Um, Jimmy Niger down in Kissimmee, he shoots. He can shoot a Canon 600 millimeter handheld. I can't do that. You know, he used to shoot the 500 handheld. I can't do that. They're too big, too heavy. So most everybody falls back at that point to, for example, the Canon 100 to 400, the Canon Straight Prime 400 5.6, or they use the 70 to 200 with a 2X on it, the Series 2, which puts you at 400 5.6, but it also gives you a 70 to 200. And so, you know, but all of those, that when you start adding teleconverters to any of these lenses, their autofocusing slows down. And, and having used a 100 to 400 with a teleconverter, having used the 70 to 200 with a teleconverter, this autofocus is just as fast, if not faster, than the Canon lenses with the Canon teleconverters. Well, and it's hand-holdable. You take pictures under other Sure. Right. Well, I don't know yet. I, don't, I haven't had a sunny day to shoot it, yeah. and I don't know if I will before, you know. Well, I'm not going to buy one yet until I let you go out and do some more. Yeah. Well, Thursday night, tomorrow night, I'm going to be out with it in Safety Harbor. But I'm very interested in Yeah. Yes, John. I was reading on that last night. It said there's a slight color cast on the low end and the high end. Boy, I sure haven't seen it. But again, you know, I, I would have to shoot something that's really critical, like some skin tones or, yeah, or shoot it on a sunny day when I can, you know. But those colors, you know, the birds, you know, none of that was really color corrected. I didn't have to re-white balance or anything. That was auto white balance, and I just left it there. So, you know, those cardinals look correct, but, you know, nature's not the same as shooting a skin tone. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. I'll look for some color cast. I'll maybe try to shoot some people pictures or something. I saw that on Craigslist. John is selling a Nikkor 600 millimeter F4. Sixty two hundred. It's negotiable. You can also use that as a um, a jack stand 
to support your car should you should you be caught with a flat i mean that's a that's a that's that's a killer lens and it's indestructible i mean it is built like a tank yeah it's a really nice lens How does that compare to a Canon DX50? um the dx50 actually zooms more the z yeah yeah but i don't think it's going to deliver the same kind of quality i mean it can do some similar things but it's not really the same quality and the convenience factor of you know these 50x point and shoots i mean that's the point of it is the convenience factor but they definitely won't work well in low light i would bet on that foggy day where i could get focus the uh the canon sx50 would have had some issues yeah any other questions larry Yeah, we talked about that before. Um, on the website, um, we will go back here real quick to this, and we got to try to show some pictures here. And we got long-winded there. Come on. It's been known to happen, Karen. Can you believe that? Yes, I do. Okay. Oh, come on. Uh, okay, bring up this page and go back here. Where is that page? Right there. All right, we're going to go back to the screen sharing again so the folks at home can see this. Come on. Okay, so um, Larry's question was uh, about getting logged in and making sure you're getting emails and things. So when you go to the Meetup site, when you go to the Meetup site, make sure that um, when you go to our page, you see your little face there. You should see it. You won't see group tools. That's for me. Um, you should see a thing that says my profile. Okay. If you're not, instead of seeing log out, you'll see a link that says log in. That means you're not logged into the website. So the first thing you got to do is get logged in. Then come back to our page. And when you do that, you should see this My Profile thing right here. Is it going to take me there? No, find my people. I'm not finding people. Um, right here under My Profile, there is a link that says Email and Notifications. Okay, If you don't see this, you're going to see a green button there that says Join this group. That means you're a member of Meetup still, but some reason you got booted out of Meetup. And I can tell you right now how that happens, not out of Meetup, but out of the group. Meetup automatically, it's not me, it's not anything I, I can adjust. If it was up to me, everybody could stay. But if your emails bounce back to Meetup for six consecutive months and you have not visited the site logged in within six months, they will remove your membership. It's that simple. And you just have to rejoin, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is if you're not going to the website while you're logged in and your email's bouncing, they kick you out. It's not up to me. It wasn't me. I still love you. But if all of this is working up to this point, you see all that, you have changed your email notifications. And it's done by group. And so what you've done is unchecked probably all of these boxes don't send reminders don't do any of this stuff I don't want any of this stuff and guess what you've turned off your email you're not going to get any email from meetup you're not going to get it from me you've removed yourself effectively so your emails aren't bouncing but you don't know about any of the events you're not getting reminders you're saying it's on me i'm going to go i'm going to study the calendar i'm going to figure out what i want to do because no one's going to send me any emails so it you know there's a happy medium i i know the meetup site sends a lot of emails out if i could change a lot of that i would believe me but you might want to say okay i want to get the ones that when the meetup is an, is announced do I care about changes? No, I'm a big boy. I can check for changes. Do I care about comments? No. 
Um, another meetup group changes. No, I don't care about that. A confirmation that I've RSVP'd. I don't need a conversation I, or, a, or a confirmation. I know what I'm going to. I don't care about ratings. I don't care about post-event greetings. Okay, but the key ones here are probably when it's announced. Okay, um, how often do you want to receive reminders? Do it at most once a day. If you say don't send me reminders, you're not going to, you know, you, you might forget that you signed up to go on an event. It happens. Disconnect or, you know, un, uncheck the photos once, and then that's really about it. You should be good to go. But if you uncheck everything, you've really removed yourself from almost all of the emails. You'd get nothing. So, Larry, that's probably where we're at. Either you, now you said you found yourself in the members list. Okay, could be, could be. Yep. If you're if you're not sure, you can always go to members, and you can do the find a member. You know, were you registered under Larry? Yeah, I'm on there. So you know, where Larry Parker? Yep. So you're still. It's not the six months. You need to adjust your settings because you're still here. Yep. There you are, riding a rocket ship. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Yes, Eileen. Either, either, makes no difference. Um, and you can also pay by credit card in any of the in-person ones. I always have my little credit card swiper goes into my phone. Okay, so that's that. All right, let's uh, get rid of that. And we're back live. Uh, I'm probably gonna need that back. Um, who gave me the food picture photographs? Somebody gave me a thumb drive with some food pictures. Who? Did. Nick did. All right, I'm going to try to get to those real quick here. And then we've got some pictures to look at. Last week we talked or, or we shot food. Some people are possibly wanting, um, you know, to see a little bit of this. So I'm going to pull a couple of Nick's pictures in and do some real simple processing in Lightroom, and then we'll move on to... Um, the group stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll do one or two of these real quick, some crops and uh, uh, edits and things. So just waiting for Lightroom to launch. This will probably be an all-day affair. Everybody ready for lunch? I understand Ron's buying lunch too. Oh, did I say that? Did I say that out loud? No. Um, I'll do a feedback, but that'll be next week. I gave everybody two weeks to upload their photos. So if you haven't, if you shot them last week and you haven't uploaded them, please, you know, if you're having problems, let me know. If you, um, uh, but otherwise, please, please get them loaded up there because um, I need to get them to Danielle at O'Keefe's and then we'll have another gift certificate. They'll pick the winner. For, for those that weren't here last week, um, the one that we shot December 18th, um, we, we had a winner picked, um, the folks from O'Keefe's, um, Garth, uh, who owns it, his wife, Dan, uh, Terry and their daughter, Danielle, they looked through the pictures that were submitted and they picked a winner. And that winner is Diane Anton over there in the corner. She shot, uh, a, a very nice, um, I guess it was fish and chips. It was fried, fried fish, French fries, coleslaw, and a lemon wedge. And uh, they were uh, they were very impressed with that. And she got a gift certificate and used it for lunch last week. I think <laughs> put it right to use. Okay, so still time to get entered in this week's. Uh, assuming you were here last week and uh, took some pictures. It's tough to enter the contest if you don't shoot food pictures. Okay, come on, Lightroom, you can do it. Or not. Come on. Boy, if I do much more of this, I'm going to have to break down and buy a computer. Okay. Come on. Uh, nobody we know. Uh, library. Oh, yeah, that's a uh, cast of a play called Rumors. And I need to import a couple of pictures here.
Okay, let me pull just a couple in. Uh, let's do that one. And let's import. Thank you for the check. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look at something like this. Uh, I got to make sure I'm sharing again. Oh my God. Uh, where's that Chrome thing? All right, folks at home, let's see if we're still sharing. Come on. Lightroom. Come on, you can do it. Okay, so let's take a look at this one, for example. Uh, um, it is, uh, looks like some nachos maybe. Yeah, jalapenos, some drizzle on it. Okay, so the first thing about this one is it's shot way too wide. Okay, um, I don't really care about the table. Uh, I don't even really care about the plate a whole lot. Um, that's not going to, I mean, when I decide where I go to a restaurant, it's not because they have the nicest wood grain tables in Clearwater. It's the food. We all go because of the food. So now that's not to say, you know, you just start all over, but we definitely, th this shot's going to need to be cropped. Ah, uh, probably to some degree, but it's not worth it. This is the shot. See, I, I fixed that reflection in the table already. <laughs> See? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I cropped it right out. It's fixed. Nobody needs to see that. See, now that's going to sell an order of nachos maybe. All right? That's what they want for their menu, not that with all the table, the plate, and everything. So you really, you know, it's, it's the old Robert Kappa. You, if you don't like your pictures, you weren't close enough. And um, that is what you're going to be looking at. The exposure and everything's about dead on the money. You know, this would need a little bit of presence, you know, to kind of give it some, some mid-contrast mid details, maybe a little vibrance. I'd stay away from the saturation. Uh, uh, saturation, blah, blah. Um, if you want to up the contrast a little bit, just a little medium contrast, and that's it. You know, you could sharpen it a little more. And if you're worried about noise, you know, I had all you guys shooting pretty low. You know, I think you were shooting at ISO 80. Um, so we could get the exposure on yours because you had limited uh, f-stops. But, you know, that's the picture. That's, that's a photograph of nachos. You know, that's, that's, you know, that's without any processing. That's with processing. So you can see where it's a little soft. We need to get that detail in the chips and, yeah, and the jalapenos and everything. So these pictures need some sharpening and things. It, uh, most of your cameras would, ne would need very little noise reduction because you were shooting it at ISO 100. So there really shouldn't be much noise at all. So that's the nacho shot. Let's go to look at another one. Let's look at another one. Okay, again, not close enough. So the first thing I'm going to do here is crop this. And it shot the white right way. You don't want the bowl of coleslaw in the foreground. You know, it's shot pretty good. Something like that. That's your shot. That's where I can go, oh, look at the bacon. Oh, boy, and that lettuce. Oh, man. Oh, I want to eat that. It's not. I wonder if that's oak or mahogany table, you know. It's about the food, folks. And so that's, again, our shot. You would need to add some presence, a little vibrance, 
but you know we pretty much nailed the exposure it's a little hot back there so i would take the highlights down you know and that's just looking at my histogram it was giving me a warning so i moved the highlights down 60 points brought a little more detail back in you know um i might leave the contrast alone and just go down here to the sharpening Yeah, it does show a lot of bread. The only way to get around that is a lower angle still. Yep. You know, that really was the ticket. Something like that, and you're ready to go. I'll do one more. This is probably, of, of the four shots I pulled up, the, the strongest one, Nick. Um, it's, it's framed pretty well. You've got the meat up front, the veggies. We get a little bit of everything. Um, we had a little issue on your, you know, it's a, a SX50. Um, had a little issue on getting your camera low enough ISO and everything. And so this needs a little more processing, though. I want to open up the shadows, see how I'm lightening up this part of the potato. I took the shadows all the way up, um, and I may even take the whites down just a little bit. You know, this is the one that's going to give me the most problems. Take the presence up. That's just mid-range detail. Brings out the Christmas, the textures, and the toppings, and the uh, broccoli. Pull up the colors a little bit. And then uh, I don't want to add any more contrast. I'm, I'm fighting contrast on this. These white plates weren't easy. And then I'd sharpen this up. Oh, yeah, fix it. So here's the deal. Here's, here's how you fix your, uh, Diane said sometimes her white plates are blue. All right, in Lightroom, you get your white balance tool, the little eyedropper and click on something that's white, like the color flower. Okay, uh, oh, I didn't like that. Well, pick on maybe this shadow area, okay? And you'll see that it, it changes a lot of the colors, and you go, well, that wasn't it either. So you can always undo it, you know, go back to where we started from and see. Or you can move the sliders manually and just move it a little bit away from the blue color. And see how I got the blue out of there? All I did was move it um, 12 points towards, that's probably yellow, okay? And so by adding a little yellow in, we also noticed the mango topping got yellower, the cheese got yellower, the zucchini got yellower. So that's really all it needed was just a little bit of yellow added to it. So you can try it with the eye drop or just try it manually, just moving your color temps. If you know your color wheel, then you know what to do. All right. Any questions on that? Jeff? Yes. We had a little problem in our group back here. We had one individual that kept adjusting the food on the plate, adjusting the location of the food on the plate, raising it up. Can you explain to us what was the goal on here? Was that an allowable type thing? Sure. I mean, I think I know who you're referring to. <laughs> I know who was here and what groups were around. Um, I mean, sure, you're you're allowed to do, you know, if you want to shoot it from a higher angle, a lower angle, or you think you need to elevate the food up to get what you want. Um, repositioning of the food, um, that's probably a little more frowned upon. Um, and I, I know the individual, I, I suggested that they not do that, and they didn't want to follow my instructions. So I, I don't want to kick somebody out. It's, it's not about that. Um, but sometimes people would be nice if they followed directions better. Well, the other thing is it took so much time. Yeah. It, it spent so much time that I don't think we got through all of them. Well, no. I mean, neither did the other group. Everybody, you know, there were some groups that, I mean, you guys actually made better progress than, than the other one because until somebody, until um, Shirley showed up late, you had fewer members. And you guys were through like two items before this group had even finished one. So it may have felt that you were slow, but really you shot, that group over there shot more things than the other group did. So, you know, but it, you know, I went into this knowing that we would probably run out of time. And it just is what it is. They have to open the restaurant at 11, just like, you know, I've got a few minutes here to show some pictures. Same kind of thing. So I won't get to everybody's today, so you have my apologies on that. Um, but... Uh, 
Sure. <laughs> okay. We're back. Uh, Jim's, Jim's, Jim's. What does Jim's look like? Probably has his name on it. That's John Sager. What did yours look like, Jim? It's a small one. It's got my name on it. A small one that does have your name on it? This little red one? Yeah, a little red. Oh, yep. It's got your name on it. All right. We're going to take a look at Jim's pictures because I messed them over two weeks ago. Okay. So this is where it really gets fun. Okay. Come on. Might be all we get to, get, get to today, folks. Let's see here. Oh, wow. Oh, we got a movie in there, too. Movies I can't show. Uh, no, no. Uh, let's see. Come on. Come on. Now, exclude that. All right. Okay. That'll launch. Okay, so now I got to move this over. This I can minimize. Where is preview? And we try to share the screen. Come on, guys. I do. So where were you, Jim? Is this just around here? No, no, this is down in Guyana. South. We're down in Guyana, okay. Taken from a boat, all right. Down in Guyana. Right, skimmer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Some storks. Come on. Thank you. 
Holler monkey. All right. That's cool. That's a nice shot. Action. <laughs> Cute fox. Ah. Eight foot otters. Oh, yeah. What you got there, Jim? Is that a capybara, I think, isn't it? Yep. Giant ant eater. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You'll have all. You, we should just post that on the on the on the website, and you, you'll you'll have all the people going. What's that bird doing down in South America? Cool. Got a spotting scope set up. Raining that day, was it? I said, was it raining that day? Uh, no, no, I'm shocked. Yeah, I, I was just going to make a comment, you know, I, I think all we needed was a full moon and a mermaid in there. And, uh... yeah, looks good to me. <laughs> Open the window. I think that's last one. Very nice, Jim. Sounds like a great trip. Um, I'll show that movie because I don't have sound or anything hooked up for that. 
So if you want to bring the movie. No, that's okay. It's, uh, I just wanted to show one of the falls and how much water was coming down. And this was at the end of dry season. And the rivers are still have plenty of water. Um, there's over 80% of the Georgian forest still, still in there. All right, I'm going to try to show one more here. Come on. Come on. There we go. These are John Saggart's. John doesn't make it here every week, so... We'll get his and a couple people uh, I'm going to owe you. So let's drop these in. Come on. Maybe we shouldn't talk so much next week. Well, there is that possibility. Nah, I thought about it. Nah. Okay. So now I'll share my screen. And maybe share my screen. There we go. Okay. Let me stretch this out a little. And let's look at content only okay where are you at John cool you got all the way to Dunedin <laughs> from Chincoteer to Dunedin wow ah pretty shot Boyd Hill, yep. Yeah. Pretty nice, I understand. Whoops. Let's go to the next one. Tell you, the Ospreys are busy. Whoops. Stuttered. Some good shots in the fog. It's a lot of fun. What kind of house is that? Yep. Cute shot. We've got a panoramic contest I'll be announcing in the next day or two. I talked about it. Um, there'll be a prize. Um, this German company is uh, giving me a piece of software, and that's going to be the first prize. So um, you can use any software. Details will be announced probably today or tomorrow. Cool. Is that it? I think so. Yep. All right. That's it, folks. Thanks very much. Um, folks at home, thanks. And uh, um, push in your chairs, bust your tables, dirty dishes up to the table by me, please. My apologies to everybody that we didn't get to see their uh, uh, thumb drive. Uh, Mary and uh, Terry. Is that? Nope. This is yours. Yep, thank you. Thanks for coming out, Nick. Sorry, Brian. Next week. There you go, sir. Thank you. Nobody showed any Seahawks. No. Seahawks. Yeah, football teams. That's all right. I know. <laughs>